evening po. Ayan. Now we're live. <laughs> good evening, ma'am. So now we're live. We're now live on Facebook. So good evening, everyone. Good evening, IFNG. Good evening, IDP. So for tonight, we are on our part two of our strategies on how to ace the exam. So, Ms. Doreen, uh, kindly introduce po our lecturer for tonight. Hello, good evening, everyone. Yes, again, thank you so much for inviting IDP Philippines in this session tonight. So our, our IELTS expert has been teaching for more than 20 years, although she doesn't look like it, but then she's been teaching English for quite a long time, right? And our IELTS expert for tonight is none other than Ms. Kathleen de Ungria. Thank you. Hi, Lori. Thank you. So hello. Um, so again, good evening. So my name is Kathleen. Um, you can call me Kat. So I'll be sharing with you some tips and strategies on how to ace your IELTS test. Okay, so let me share first my slides. Okay. So, okay, so let's start then. So what is IELTS all about? So we all know that in the IELTS test, you have to take four skills, right? So there are four macro skills. We have listening, we have reading, we have writing, and we have speaking. So I'm going to give you some, like I mentioned, tips on how to ace your test. So let's start first with listening. Okay. So Maybe you're wondering how can I improve my IELTS listening score? Well, there are many ways for you to improve your IELTS listening score, but I think the best way for you to improve your score, number one, when you do practice tests, you have to train yourself to listen to the recording once. They say YOLO, so you only listen once, okay? Why? Because in the actual test, you only have one chance to listen to the file, right? So you have to get used to it. So that's one tip. Another, um, you have to practice listening to different situations, lectures, discussions, or maybe a conversation between two people. Because one of the things that you have to do during the listening test is to um, determine the communicative function or the roles of people. And when you do your practice listening, you are also, let's say you become familiar with the different accents because some people or some accents, they can tend to be very thick and some of them speak very fast. So that's, it's very important that you, uh, you listen to different speaking situations, right? So another thing, um, what are you supposed to listen for? You have to remember that the IELTS test, you need to have two skills. You need to have the English skills and also the, or the language skills or also the test taking skills. So in the listening test, you're being tested whether you can listen to specific information such as details, dates, or maybe names and instructions. So these are the things that you're supposed to listen uh, these are the things that you need to listen to. Another, you have to listen for the gist or let's say the overall meaning. Um, another, like I've mentioned earlier that you have to recognize communicative function or the role because sometimes there will be files about, let's say a discussion between let's say a doctor and a patient or maybe a person going to a garage and let's say a mechanic and a customer. So these things. Another, uh, you have to determine also the speaker's attitude and the mood uh, so that from the intonation and from the speech rate or what in language learning, we call it peaks and valleys, you will, you would be able to determine whether the person is elated, sad, or maybe ecstatic. So you can determine their mood. Another, um, you have to listen for, um, or let's just say you have to be able to anticipate what is coming and be able to make inferences and deductions, right? 
So for the listening test, the first tip, it's very important that you use your time to read the questions and see the topics. Like what I've mentioned, there are things that you're supposed to do. One is to listen for certain information or specific details. So you use your time to read the questions and see the topic so you know what to listen for. Otherwise, you'll end up listening to everything. And then when it's time for you to answer the questions, you do not know what to write. Okay. And then underline keywords. Uh, the keywords will help you focus on questions. I believe with the paper-based exam, you're allowed to encircle or underline certain keywords. The same thing with the CDI, else I believe you can highlight the words. So it will help uh, by doing so, you can focus on the questions. Another is think of synonyms to help you predict the likely content. Like I've mentioned, you have to anticipate what is coming. So you need to have what we call vocabulary, um, um, become affluent with vocabulary, meaning to say that you need to have a wide or enough words to help you get by in the exam. And then questions follow the recording order. So just keep on going. So you don't have to jump from one question to the next, all right? And next, stick to the word limit. I think this is one of the biggest problems. Um, remember, you need to have test taking skills. You need to follow directions. So if the instruction says one word or a number, then you, can, you need to provide only, or you need to write only one word. If you add, let's say um, an article, or another pronoun, then that becomes two words or three words, then you are already uh, committing, or let's say making a costly mistake because you did not follow the instruction, all right? So stick to the word limit and don't copy across extra words. And last but not the least, intonation helps. So like what I've mentioned, one of the things that you're supposed to listen for, um, is you need to be able to recognize communicative uh, function and role and also determine the mood, okay? And the attitude of the speakers. And you can only do this if you know how to listen to the intonation. So you can tell how happy, like I've mentioned, how happy, how sad, or whether the person is, let's say, complaining or ranting, there's a difference. So you really need to understand intonation. Okay, the peaks and the valleys. Now let's go to the next skill, reading. So sometimes people would ask me, or let's say not even my students, okay? Sometimes they would ask me what makes reading challenging? Well, for example, with the IELTS test, what makes a reading test challenging, I believe, okay, based on experience, number one, the reading test is, um, the, there's a lot of words that you have to read, okay? So each passage, there will be, let's say, 900 words. So that's a lot of words for you to read. So the amount of words to deal with, a lot. And there will be a lot of unfamiliar words, okay? so. The best thing that you can do while you are preparing for the exam is to build your vocabulary, okay? Another thing that makes the reading test challenging is what we call time pressure. Remember, this is a high pressure situation, right? So you have 40 questions, you have three uh, passages to read, and then you only have 60 minutes. So within the 60 minute period, you need to answer how many questions? 40. So what can you do? You have to be familiar with the different reading techniques. So we have skim, skimming, we have scanning, and reading for detail. So if you understand the task type, okay, so there are different task types. If you understand the task types, um, then you would know how to approach them. And how do you approach them? By using the different reading techniques. Again, it's skimming, scanning, and reading for detail. So while you're preparing, try to um, 
understand the difference between the three techniques so you can use them during the test. Okay. So it says here the first tip, read the questions first. So the same thing with listening, you really have to read the questions first so you know what to look for, okay? Uh, remember, the test lasts for 60 minutes. I repeat, you have 40 questions to answer, and then you have three passages. There are, and these passages, they contain, again, 2,200 to 2,750 words. That's a lot. So if you will read the, the text first without knowing what to look for, you are wasting precious time. And if you waste time, that's a costly mistake. So always read the questions first, okay? And then underline keywords. So again, the same, the keywords will help you focus. So it's very important that you underline keywords that will help you understand the text. Another note, the number of words allowed in your answer, the same. It's all about following the instructions. So if it's asking you for two words or no more than two words, and please do not add another word because you're trying to be sure. Always follow the number or always uh, follow the instructions on how many words you're allowed okay, to have for your answer or in your answer. And then don't worry about words you don't know. Um, Unusual words will be explained within the text. If the word isn't explained, it means it's not important. Um, you have to understand that the materials or the passages uh, in the IELTS test or used in the IELTS test were, let's say they were originally designed, okay? Originally designed for a non-specialist audience, okay? And are of general interest. So you don't need to worry if you're not a specialist because your specialist knowledge is not being tested. What is being tested in the reading uh, test are your skills, okay? your skills in reading. Okay? So whether you know how to skim for information, scan for information or read for details. Okay? Um, I repeat, that's why you need to become familiar with the different task types. So you know how to approach the reading test. And then don't waste time on any one question you're having trouble with. So let's say you're already spending about, let's say 30 seconds. Remember you only have 60 minutes and there are 40 questions. So you can skip it, but don't forget to make sure that you complete. Okay? <laughs> Your answers. Otherwise, it will be marked wrong. Okay, it will be marked wrong. And then one mark for each right answer. No penalty for wrong answers. So again, I repeat: for reading, it's not your knowledge about the topic that is being tested. It's about your reading skills. Okay. So skim, scan, and read for detail. Okay, let's go to writing. You're, I do not know. Do you like writing? I think most people, uh, they find writing challenging. Okay, so how are you scored? It's important that you know how you're, you will be scored by your rater or your examiner. Why? So you know what to do during the test so that you can meet your desired band score. I think most people, they, they, they would like to have a seven, right? Seven, eight, and nine. So how do you get a seven? How do you get an eight? How do you get a nine, right? So let's start with the first one. Um, you have to understand that in the writing test, okay? In the writing test, um, they are, you're being graded for in four things, and they are equally divided to quarters, so 25% each, okay? So each descriptor. So first we have task achievement and task response. So for both task achievement and task response, it's all about satisfying the requirements of the task. 
So how do you satisfy the requirements of the task? The easiest thing for you to do is for you to meet the number of words required. For academic task one and for GT task one, you need to have at least 150 words, okay? For task two, you need to have 250 words. Um, what if you don't meet the 150 words and definitely you're not satisfying the requirements of the task. But apart from that, how else do you satisfy the requirements of the task? Number one, you have to make sure that um, you read the prompt, for example, for academic task one, you read the prompt, do not copy across the prompt, okay? Because if you do that, you'll be marked down for copying extra words or it copying exactly how it was written in the prompt. So you need to recast it in your own words, okay? And also for task one academic, you need to provide a clear overview. Well, what is an overview? An overview is the overall, okay? It's the gist, it's the executive summary, it's the most important message. And in your overview, you need to show the trends without Okay, without using any data. Because if you use the numerical data provided in the graph, okay, what happens is that you have nothing else to write in the body. That's why it's very important that you are able to uh, describe what is happening okay, with the overall trend in your overview. So what happens now if let's say I have an overview, but why did I not get a seven? Probably it's a six, but why is it a six? Okay, it's a six because maybe your overview is not clear. It's not clear because you use irrelevant words or probably it's inadequate or probably you did not really uh, discuss the overall trend or maybe inaccurate, okay? So those four things can affect your overview. Um, an overview can be one or two sentences. It can be right after, let's say, the introduction, okay? Or it can be the last uh, paragraph of your essay. So always uh, pick out three or four things, the most significant things, sorry. I need to emphasize on that. The three or four most significant things and write them in general terms, meaning to say do not include the data. Now for task achievement, general training, how do you satisfy the requirements of the task? There will always be bullets. So you have to have a salutation, right? And it's then you also need to have a complimentary closing. And the body, how do you develop the body? You need to follow the three bullets. What if you only answered one part, okay? Let's say, and then you forgot the other two, then you're not satisfying the requirements of the task. What if you answered all three, but you did not see that it's asking for suggestions? So always be uh, check for, let's say plurals, okay? Because if it's asking you for suggestions and you only gave one suggestion, then you're not satisfying the requirements of the task. That's why you always need to uh, spend at least, let's say, a few seconds to identify the requirements of the task so you can satisfy it. With the task response, that's task two. So with task two, you need more words, right? Because it's what we call discursive essay. So what is a discursive essay? Discursive essay requires supporting evidence, okay? evidences, because you need to, uh, let's say, you need to prove that whatever it is that you claim or your position, okay? So you, because you need to make them understand your position and your claim, okay? So sometimes it's asking you whether you agree or disagree, so you definitely need to justify your uh, position by giving them evidences or examples, okay? Um, another thing, um, let's say for example, 
in in your mind you already provided all the evidences but the question is how accurate are your evidences or let's say appropriate it's more about appropriacy okay it's more about appropriacy um Yes, you can. You think you have already addressed the task, but maybe for the rater, if the evidences you provided are were not uh, accurate, then it becomes partially addressed. A band seven, you address all parts. Okay, so for example, there are some essays that would only require you one part. There are some essays that would require you two parts. There are some essays you have to provide your rater three parts. So you need to know how to dissect the props. Otherwise, you end up uh, answering only one question or not really providing um, enough examples. Okay, so how do you develop your ideas? First, you need to plan. Next, you organize your ideas because remember you need to reach 250 words. You develop your ideas by providing relevant supporting, it repeats, relevant supporting evidences and examples. And then focus the ideas uh, to the, I, uh, how should I say it? Focus on the ideas you, you need to say the most or you need to write about the most and fully develop them. Um, remember that a band seven, um, how should I say, a band seven presents and extends and supports main ideas, right? But there may be a tendency for you to overgeneralize, but that's a band seven. While a band, band five, you present main ideas, but very limited ideas were presented, okay? So there are three things you have to remember. One, make your opinion clear. Please do not become a fence-sitter. A fence-sitter is more like, oh, it's up to the reader to decide. You're not being judged for your opinion. So you, it's either you agree or you don't agree. Okay, so you agree, disagree, and you have to explain why you agree and why you disagree. Another one, next, give your reasons, your opinions, or illustrate what you mean with examples, okay? And then finally, highlight the most important parts. That's task achievement and task response. Another uh, quarter would be the coherence and cohesion. So what is coherence and cohesions? cohesion? This is about how you clearly organize or present your arguments, okay? So it relates on whether you organize it in sequence, uh, logically, all right, so information in paragraphs. And you can only show that you have the skill or you know how to apply coherence and cohesion in writing by using transitional words or cohesive devices. Uh, you have, however, what else? Although, um, you also have the connectors, we have but, we have and. There are many cohesive devices. Um, the favorite of most writers, they would say first, this is my idea, second and third. That's okay, but you're trying to get a seven. So for your coherence and cohesion, you need to avoid first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. What if you have 10 examples? So 10th. For your rater, it's more of mechanical. So if you're your way of organizing ideas is uh, too mechanical, that goes down to a five. Nobody wants to get a five, right? So you really need to show that you know how to organize your ideas for coherence and cohesion. You have a clear beginning and an ending, and then everything else that comes between should be organized into uh, easily readable chunks, in, or in other words, paragraphs. Okay, so how do you make a good paragraph? You need to have a topic sentence, at least two or three uh, supporting evidences and your concluding paragraph. Okay, so you need to summarize that. That's a proper paragraph. And then proper paragraph, remember it's absolutely essential. The usual questions we get, uh, should I leave a space or should I not? Should I just indent? 
it depends. But remember, you need to show to your rater that you know how to make paragraphs. So if let's say you're taking the paper base exam, definitely if you don't have enough space, then you indent. But if you have enough space, your paragraph, then leave a space in paragraph. But if you're taking the CD IELTS, you can just indent, right? So what happens now if you don't show paragraphs and it becomes a block essay? That's an automatic five, okay? So you don't want that. So remember, uh, in the writing test, your ability to write paragraphs, including those you need to write for information and conclusion should be in logical order, okay? And then, we have lexical resource. So question is how good is how good your vocabulary is. So are you able to choose the right language for the task? Are you able to use a wide range of vocabulary with very natural and sophisticated control of lexical features? Because sometimes the problem uh, is, is that people like to use big words. You know, it's okay to use big words or high polluting words. But the question is, do you know how to use them? Okay, so also you need to know whether a word uh, would have a negative or a positive connotation because it can affect the overall meaning of your sentence. Um, if you keep on repeating the same words over and over again, definitely, I think the highest score you, you would get is a six. So you need to show a variety of words, but it should be appropriately used, okay? Um, can you use idioms? Yeah, why not? But uh, sometimes it, idioms, they usually apply in speaking, but rarely in writing. Okay, so it's too informal. Remember it, academic and GT essays, you're supposed to show that you can write, okay? You may use quotes, but you have to explain them, okay? And last but not the least, you have grammatical range and accuracy. Um, it's not just about having the ability to use or know how to apply subject verb agreement. It's also your ability to stitch ideas together, okay? Um, in one sentence, um, grammar, uh, grammatical range and accuracy or GRA is displaying, um, is displaying how your grand, I, let me rephrase this. You're trying to explain your grand ideas into a variety of sentence types and writing style, okay? Uh, so for example, with um, are you using or are you only writing simple structures? That's fine. But if your paragraph contains only sing, simple structures, then probably the highest you can get would be a six. But if you're showing a variety, you have simple, you have complex, you have compound structures, then you can get a seven and even higher, okay? You need to show that there's a range. It in, uh, if you use a range of sentences, it increases your chances of getting a higher band, okay? Especially if you try to attempt to use complex structures. Um, no, in general, uh, simple sentences, you can use that when you're making, uh, when making main points, okay? But you use complex structures when you're expanding the main point, okay? For example, you use that when you're giving information, you're giving supporting ideas, you're giving explanation to your claim. So remember, for you to get a high score for grammatical range and accuracy, show a variety of structures. Do not stick to simple structures just because you want to be safe, okay? So tips for writing. So allocate your time properly. So task two is worth twice as much as task one. So Sometimes people would ask, should I work on task one first or task two? It's up to you, okay? But remember, you need to finish both tasks. 
and then decide on your position, express your view clearly and provide support uh, such as examples and evidence. So when you say decide on your position, do you agree or you disagree? If you decide, um, let's say for example, you cannot really make a stand because you think you have two uh, minds on that particular idea, then you can say, oh, I agree on this because, however, if this is a situation, then I disagree. As long as you explain why you're in that kind of position, then you can still get a seven, okay? You always provide examples and evidence. But when I say examples, they should be relevant, appropriate, and accurate to the task. Organize ideas into paragraphs, each with a clear focus, that's very important. So how many paragraphs do you need? Maybe for a 250 word essay, you need a minimum of three paragraphs, three to four paragraphs, all right? And make sure that you show that you have paragraphs. Otherwise, no matter how good your answer is, but if there's no paragraph, then um, you will be right down to let's say five for coherence and cohesion. So use a range of vocabulary and grammatical structures. That's very important. Again, you need to build your vocabulary, okay? Um, and then analyze the task and write relevant content. Remember, there are many task types in writing. Uh, you need to provide an opinion. It can be a multi-part question plus opinion. It can be an opinion essay. So you need to know the different task types. So you know how to approach them. And then use a variety of linking words to connect and sequence your ideas. So please do not stay with, or do not keep on using first, second, third, fourth. You can say first and then next. There are many. Don't stick to the usual uh, first, second, and third and fourth. And then do not write in note form or use headings, bullet points, or numbered lists. So let's say, for example, you're trying to show that you have a lot of examples, write them in paragraph form or in sentence form. Do not write them in bullet points. Otherwise, your coherence and cohesion will also uh, get a low score. Okay. And then check your work carefully, know your usual mistakes. So if your usual mistakes, let's say, would be in subject verb agreement, if you still have time, read again, okay? And then look for, um, use your usual mistakes, maybe the spelling, okay? Or um, not so much in the capitalization. If you are, if you're, let's say, uh, you taking the paper base, okay? but it's more of the grammar, the spelling, and punctuation marks, before I forget, punctuation marks. That's very important. So let's go to speaking. Um, do you like speaking in English? Okay. Uh, for example, some of my students, they don't like to speak in English because they find it awkward. So usually there's hesitation, okay? Um, in the speaking test, yes, you are face-to-face -face with your examiner. So you need to know how you're being scored so that um, you can get the highest score possible, okay? So there are three parts. Part one, you spend four to five minutes, you discuss, um, it focuses on your ability to communicate uh, opinions about maybe about your first school, whether your first school was was good or bad, okay? And then information, let's say everyday topics. And then for part two, uh, you have three to four minutes. It's an individual long term, as they call it. So in this part, you focus on the topic given to you by your examiner, then you explain. Um, for part three, you have four to five minutes, and then this is a discussion part. So here, this part of the test focuses on your ability to express and justify opinions. So remember, part three is not about you, so you need to answer in general, okay? Um, 
Examiners assess your speaking ability by matching your performance to the band descriptors, right? So each uh, criterion counts 25% of your speaking, right? So let's start with the first one. 25% um, for fluency and coherence. So what is fluency and coherence? This is uh, about whether you can speak without repeating or correcting oneself, um, whether the candidate, let's say, can speak at length about a topic, and then you're giving a well-organized answer with reasons or examples. Um, if you are, uh, if you are not providing your examiner a memorized answer, your examiner would know that if you're providing a memorized answer. Uh, also, in, with fluency and coherence, your examiner is checking whether you are using the right connecting words and discourse markers. Um, whether you are able to um, show flexibility when you're speaking. Okay. So in short, fluency and coherence is all about being able to talk smoothly okay, without too much hesitation or much hesitation. Um, coherence is all about making it easy for the listener to follow and understand what you're saying. Okay. Um, for example, let's say you're trying to get a nine, okay? So if you're trying to aim for a nine, one should speak fluently with only rare, okay, with only rare repetition or self-correction. You're fully develops the topics and then appropriately talks about it and speaks coherently about it, okay? And you show, um, appropriate cohesive features, while a six, yes, you're talking. Uh, there's willingness to speak at length, though sometimes you lose coherence and times, sometimes there's occasional repetition, so that happens, all right? So that's the difference between a nine and a six. Remember, a nine, you should speak fluently. If there's hesitation, probably because you're just thinking, but you know, you still know what to say. While lexical resource, again, it's about vocabulary. Okay, so this criterion refers to the range of vocabulary used, and it's all about precision with the meanings and attitudes. Okay, um, so key indicators for lexical resource, one variety of words, so the candidate uses adequate, sufficient, or wide range of vocabulary. Another, you're using less common lexical items, such as idioms or collocations. Um, again, it's all about adequacy and appropriacy of words used and your ability to what we call circumlocute, okay? Meaning to say you're able to get around a vocabulary gap by using words, other words, without noticeable hesitation, okay? Another would be grammatical range and accuracy. Again, this is about the percentage of sentences, whether your sentences are error-free, okay? So whether you're using a range of structures, complex structures, again, it should be all, should, it should always be a mix of simple and complex structures, all right, for grammatical range and accuracy. Um, Let's say, for example, you have grammar lapses. If the grammar lapse is not or does not impede communication, you can still get a seven. But if there's too many grammar lapses, then it goes down maybe to a six. But if you can only form basic sentences and then you try to use complex structures and there are a lot of grammar mistakes, then it can be a five, okay? And last but not the least, we have pronunciation. So pronunciation, it's all about whether you're able to convey and enhance meaning. Uh, it's all about how you say, whether you can say things clearly, not too fast, not too slow, 
is it all about accent? No, it's not about accent. It's about whether you can, uh, whether your speech is intelligible or not. I think that's a, that's a myth. Uh, it's something that needs to be dispelled because some candidates think that they will get a higher score for pronunciation if they sound British, if they sound like the Queen, whether they sound, whether they have the American twang. Remember there are different accents, okay? It's all about clarity in speaking, whether there's chunking, proper chunking, whether there's proper use of stress and intonation, okay? Um, whether your accent, let's say you're trying to put on an accent, whether your accent can cause strain for the listener. But if your accent is clear, even if it's Filipino accent, you can still get a seven, an eight, and a nine, okay? So your examiners, okay, the raters, the raters, they are trained to have what they call an international ear. Okay, so how do you get a high score for pronunciation? To achieve a high mark, you have to show that you use a wide range of pronunciation features. We're talking about rhythm, we're talking about stress, we're talking about intonation. You talk appropriate, uh, talk at, a, at an appropriate speed, and you show control of individual sounds. Okay. In other words, okay, you have to speak at length, okay, overall, for you to get a good score. You need to speak at length, producing a fluent and coherent answer. Another is having the right vocabulary to answer the question, having the grammar and syntax to produce a coherent answer, and fourth, having a clear and acceptable pronunciation, good phonological control. Okay, so tips for the speaking test. Listen, read, and think in English before the test. I think this is uh, one of the things that you need to train yourself, okay? Um, you need to think in English. Start training yourself selves to think in English because if you translate from Filipino to English, it can also affect your ability to produce uh, a good sentence or to produce a good answer, okay? So you have to listen, you read. Uh, why? Because you need to build your vocabulary again. Talk at a steady rate, not too fast or too slow. If you talk too fast, it will not make the speaking test go faster. No, it's not. It's fixed to 11 to 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, usually, if you speak too fast, then your pronunciation is also affected. Then you cannot get a good score for pronunciation. And then you use the preparation minute to make notes. Your examiner will give you one minute to think about what you're going to say about the, the, the topic. So write down every keyword that you need to help you remember and for, to help you come up with a good answer. And then use natural fillers like now, let me think to avoid pauses and phrases or how do you say this? So instead of just sitting there looking at your examiner and being quiet, use fillers, okay? And then don't sound flat, use stress and intonation. Again, it's all about the peaks and valleys, okay? You need to sound alive when you're talking. Another, don't worry about a grammar mistake, move on, because if you keep on correcting yourself, it can also affect fluency and coherence. Um, another tip for speaking, you need to start um, thinking of certain topics, usual topics for speaking. We have, like this one, sorry, before I move to that. You need to start thinking of uh, words that you can associate with a certain topic, let's say for health, whether the vocabulary uh, about health, another will be for, let's say education, maybe with sports or let's say arts. Okay, so think of words that you can associate with those topics. 
Uh, you need to give more details about each of the points you make, uh, especially for part three. Okay. And then explain your answers by giving reasons for what you say. Don't just say, oh, let's say your examiner asks you, what's your favorite color? And then you say red. And then silent. No, you need to explain why red. Oh, I love red because, et cetera, et cetera. Part three, weigh up both sides of the question and give examples to support them. So remember, you need to justify your, your answers in part three. And then rehearse, work, study, and where you live questions, but sound natural. Remember your examiner would know if you're providing a canned answer or a memorized answer. That's why, yes, you can rehearse, but do not memorize, okay? Do not, you have to sound natural still, natural still. And then give your opinion, like in my view, as far as I'm concerned, generally speaking, I'd say. Um, there are other ways to start your sentence, but what if you start your sentence by, let's say your examiner asks you, um, do you think, let's say, do you think education in the Philippines, et cetera, et cetera. If you start your sentence by saying, I think education in the Philippines, no, you, you're not showing that you have a wide range of vocabulary. So you can say, oh, I believe that the education in the Philippines, or let's say you can find, oh, I never thought of that, but I believe that the education system in the Philippines, et cetera, et cetera. Do not start by reciting. It's like you're reciting. It, like if they ask you, what is your name? You say, my name is, if you keep on doing that, then you cannot get a good score for vocabulary. And then practice typical IELTS topics like education, health, fitness, travel, transport, leisure, and communication. That's uh, like what I mentioned earlier. And you need to start creating, let's say, a list of words that you can associate with this uh, IELTS, uh, with these IELTS topics, right? Okay. So you have to remember that you have to make the most, let me move this, you have to make the most of every opportunity to use English. Um, I do not know if you use English at work, but I hope you do. So practice, 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 practice. Okay, so maybe what you can do is you can start talking to your friends in English, talking to your family members in English, or every time you order something, use English, All right? And then set targets for your pre pre uh, preparation. If you need, let's say two to three months, then prepare. It's not something, English is not something that you learn overnight. Okay? You really need to practice. And then it's not IDP who will choose which module you should be taking. So you need to know exactly whether you need to take academic or general training, okay? Um, and then know how you're scored. So if you can find the, um, the band descriptors so that you every time you practice, oh, I need to meet seven. So these are the things that I have to do. I need to get a nine. So this is the, these are the features. Then I need to do this, okay? And then IELTS preparation courses focus more on test taking skills than language skills. So. Again, you need to have two skills. You have, you need to have the language skills and test taking skills for you to get uh, a good score for IELTS. And then everyday counts towards language skills. An IELTS seven or higher represent thousands of hours of learning and using English. So again, I repeat, it's not something you learn overnight. You really need to practice. Um, expose yourself to the language, watch a lot of English movies, or listen to a lot of English songs, read um, different uh, English, or what we call serious English materials, okay? Um, let's say, for example, when you're watching movies, if you want to improve your pronunciation, then imitate how they deliver their, their lines, that would help. Or if, let's say, when you're watching 
uh, to improve your listening when you're watching, let's say BBC or you're watching uh, NPR podcasts or you're listening to NPR podcasts, for example, then you are exposing yourself and to different pronunciation, to different accents, so you become familiar. So during the listening test, you won't be surprised how thick their accents are. So remember, for example, with Australian accent, there are maybe around 27 different Australian accents. So you really need to expose yourselves to this accents and become familiar. And then take a long-term approach. Please, um, if you're not in a hurry, do a lot of uh, IELTS practice tests. Okay. Review, it would help. And then anything you do in English will help you to improve your language skills, that's true. Um, I always tell my students that they need to read because I notice people nowadays, they don't really need, they, they read on Facebook but they don't really read serious English language materials and you need to read because when you read, you're able to mine vocabulary, you become vocabulary affluent and not vocabulary and not suffer from what they call vocabulary poverty, okay? And then push yourself every day and everywhere, okay? So it's very important that you speak in English all the time and read in English. I think reading it will help, okay? So anyway, so thank you. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll call on Lori to discuss the next steps. Hi, Ms. Kath. Thank you so much for all those tips that you've given. I'll be needing your help in okay. clicking the okay. slides. All right, so by the way, my name is Lorraine and I am the administrative staff, the test center administrator for IDP Philippines PH009 or the Manila Test Center. All right, let's move on to the next slide, Ms. Kath, please. Thank you. So IDP administers the examination here in the Philippines and also globally. So our office, our main office is here in Marco Polo, Ortigas, um, Sapphire Road, Pasig City. So our test center is PH009, and we have another test center in Cebu. It's PH152. All right. So let's move on. I'll show you our different test locations. So our aim is to bring the IELTS test to so many different places here in the Philippines. So we administer the tests in these different locations. So from north down to south, we offer the IELTS. So the ones listed um, on the left side are our paper-based test venue. So wherever you are, whether you're from Manila or from Davao, and yeah, for, even from Tugagarao, we are conducting the IELTS test. So if you would like to, if you're interested to take your examination, your test here, in any of these locations, right? You just need to visit um, our registration site so that you would know our um, test dates. Um, so the most frequent ones that we have are the ones here in Metro Manila because we offer the test at least um, three times a month here in Metro Manila. So we offer it in Pasig, Quezon City, and in Makati, right? So our um, computer-delivered IELTS tests are offered in Manila, Cebu, and in Baguio. So for Manila, we offer the computer-delivered IELTS every day. Um, we have two sessions a day. For Cebu, we offer it um, from Wednesday up until Sunday, two sessions as well. And for Baguio, we have Fridays and Saturdays. We have two sessions as well. So you may also visit our um, website for the test dates that we offer for the computer delivered IELTS. All right. Thank you, Ms. Kat. Next slide, please. So if you will register with IDP, you, these are the value added services that you will be getting from us. Okay. So aside from administering the examination, the test, we also help test takers prepare for the test because we know that preparation is very essential when it comes to taking the IELTS. So first of all, um, the computer delivered IELTS 
uh, results are released in three to five days. So if you are in a hurry to get your test results, um, you may opt to take the computer delivered IELTS because the results are released faster. So for the paper-based test, um, results are released in 13 calendar days, but with a computer delivered IELTS, you can have your results in just three to five days. All right, next one, Ms. Kath. All right, so the computer delivered IELTS does not only offer the standard or the regular IELTS, meaning when we talk about regular IELTS, these are the, uh, these are the IELTS required from Canada, Australia, um, New Zealand, and US. So if you are bound for UK, there is an examination for you and it's called IELTS for UKVI. With IDP, it is also offered on the computer. Right, next slide, Ms. Kath. All right, so in terms of preparation, IDP has a lot of um, preparation tools for you. Although for now, because it's pandemic, um, we offer most of them online. So one of which is the first one. All right, so for the paper-based IELTS test takers in Luzon and also in some parts of the Visayas, we offer the wireless headphones for the listening test. So if you would like to get a good score or high score in the listening test, you are you may opt to take your examination in these different locations because in Luzon, we offer the wireless headphones for the listening test. So each test taker will have his or her own headphones so that you can concentrate more when you are doing the listening test. So you have clarity, you feel isolated, then you can adjust the volume according to your preference so that you can focus more and get the score that you need for the listening test. So again, the wireless headphones are offered in our Luzon test venues and also in Cebu. All right. Okay, one more click. All right, then. Okay, that's it, Ms. Kath. Thank you. So um, also, if you will book for an examination with us, we offer a lot of webinar sessions. So Philippines, IDP Philippines has a lot of um, webinars offered to test takers. We usually hold them uh, on Wednesdays afternoon. Also, the Southeast Asian team offers um, webinar sessions as well. So we have different time slots. We have some webinars um, available in the afternoon and some of them at night because of the timing. And also, if you will visit our um, Facebook page, uh, we also offer the IELTS Australia webinar sessions that we have. So if you would like to watch some of um, our IELTS experts from, uh, from different countries, you may just simply visit our Facebook page and watch some of the webinar sessions that we have concluded um, previously. Okay. All right. And also, if you will book for an examination with us, you get the chance to enjoy our Macquarie, online Macquarie preparation tool. So you have two options. So actually, you can purchase it from Australia, but with IDP, it's being offered for free. Okay. You just need to visit your payment confirmation and all of the preparation tools that we have are actually included in that email. So for the Macquarie preparation tool, you have the option to choose um, either enjoy all four skills, preparation for all four skills within 14 days, or if you just want to focus on one particular skill, you can enjoy um, accessing that site for 30 days. All right, so if you have questions about these um, preparation tools, you just need to send us an email and we would be very, very happy to explain it to you. Okay, so you just need to decide all four skills or just one particular skill. All right. Next slide, Ms. Kath. Okay, so for our paper-based test takers, we offer these free SMS sending of provisional IELTS test results. So some of our test takers, they can't wait. After 13 days, they want to know their scores already probably they need to send their scores to an institution already. So the provisional scores can be sent via SMS on the day results are actually released. So you just need to sign up for it, give us your preferred mobile number, 
And yeah, on the 13th day after your test, we will send you your test scores, your provisional test scores. All right, next one. And these are our premium services. All right, so most of our test takers would like to um, be assisted with uh, their writing skills. Okay, most of them, they would inquire, do we offer preparation for um, the writing component? So this is what we offer the writing enhanced for only 1,500 pesos. You get the chance to respond to um, a particular task, one task for the task one writing test and also another task for the task two and get personalized feedback from our IELTS experts. So if you want to know more about this, you just need to send us an email um, and I'll show you our email address in the file. Next one, scan. All right, so if you have other questions and if you would like to know more about um, the examinations, the tests that we offer, please visit um, www.idp.com and yeah, check out our Facebook page so you would know um, all the preparation tools that we offer to our test takers. So wherever you are in the world, you just visit our Facebook page and you get the opportunity to yeah, watch our webinar sessions. Um, so visit facebook.com IDP Philippines. All right. So again, our office is in Marco Polo Ortigas, Sapphire Road, Pasig City. Right. So we will be answering the questions that we have. Right. Ms. Gladys. Hi. Hi, Ms. Lorraine. Yeah. Ms. Lorraine, we have questions from Zoom and on Facebook. So from Shaman Lamponi from Zoom. For paper-based test, can I write my answers in all caps? Please enlighten me. All right. I okay, Miss. answered before, right? <laughs> yes. From our previous webinar. However, I think yeah. it's her first time to attend our lecture. So, mm -hmm. oh, Miss Lorraine. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, although I would be asking uh, the assistance of our IELTS expert. Okay, I'll give her the chance to respond to that question. So the question is whether oh, cap capital uh, letters. The, oh, capital letters. Yes, for paper base, it's okay to use capital letters. Okay, even with the CDILs, they're not checking whether you can, you know, when to capitalize. But yeah, it's okay to write in capital letters. You will not get a low score because of that. What the raters are checking uh, is whether you really have the ability to develop the topic and answer the topic, provide your opinion. That's what they're checking, not your ability to write in all caps. Okay, okay. although I... I I would only like to add, if you'd be writing in all capital letters, you just have to be very, very, very careful with punctuation. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, a paragraph may seem like an entire sentence. So mm -hmm. if you'd be writing in all capital letters, just be very mindful of either indention or yeah, your punctuations. Okay, another one from, this one is from Facebook, from Ms. Mizi Salvador. Is IELTS UKVI different from IELTS Academic? Thanks. All right. Okay, I'll answer that one because I think that's um, administrative. So IELTS has two um, test modules, academic and general training. All right. So also for the UKVI, um, basically the UKVI and the standard, probably you would hear some people say standard or regular IELTS. They're actually the same questions, same scoring system, same, yeah. For example, if I am taking the standard IELTS and Miss Kath is taking the UKVI on the same day, we'd just be answering the same sets of questions. The only difference is that UKVI has 
cameras around you because everything is recorded on video. So which also means that UKVI has both academic and general training, right? So IELTS has academic and general training. IELTS for UKVI, it has academic and general training as well. So just the same. Okay. okay. So from... Okay. Yeah, sorry, you just need to ask your um, visa officer if you have to take UKVI or the standard or regular IELTS. Okay, so uh, another one from Jason. Once we booked our appointment in IDP, are we automatically included in your promo, which is a full refund if our overall band score landed in 7.5 or higher? Mm -hmm. That one, it, you can have the chance because we do it raffle. So it, it does not automatically mean that if you get a score of 7.5, you will get the full refund. So you get the chance because there are, I think every quarter or I'm not, I don't know when is the next draw. So if you um, enroll yourself in that promo and you are picked, randomly picked, uh, you get the chance to have your test fee refunded, but it, it is not automatic, okay? Meaning if you get a 7.5, you get an automatic refund of the test fee. So you get the chance to join um, the raffle. It's like that. So this is from Ney Mosqueda and from Elisha Pongase. So they are asking if your promo is applicable in IDP Kuwait and IDP Canada. So from Elisha, Elisha, can I avail of the free materials even if I'm registered IDP Canada? I'm taking the test next week. Okay. Well, um, the test center in Canada is a different test center, although it's under IDP, but we are a different test center. So we offer different promos for our test takers. So they have their own promo there in Canada. Okay. okay. So this Okay, this is from Raisa Rugasan from Zoom. In the speaking exam, will it be a mark against me if I ask the question again? Mm, okay, our IELTS expert can answer that. Ask probably the, can, the test taker would ask for, uh, for you to repeat the question. No, that's not a minus point for you. You're just trying to clarify. That's okay, you can ask them, but just ask them one time. Do not keep on asking them the same question over and over again. Yes, but you can ask them to clarify it for you. We can also ask them to simplify, let's say a word, maybe that word is confusing for you. Then they can, I think they are allowed to give you a, sim a simpler term for that, but yes. You can ask your examiner to repeat the question. That's not a problem. Probably you misheard. You're just trying to uh, ask your examiner so that you can give the right answer. That's okay. Okay. So from Jenver Bagorio, I think this one is contrary to the writing part. Uh, sorry, on uh, from the paper based rather. So his question is. It's okay to write in all caps in writing computer based. Yes, yes, it's okay. Remember, you're not being tested whether you can write in all caps or not. Whether it's as long as you're showing par uh, proper paragraphing, okay? Proper paragraphing, proper punctuation marks, proper spelling, proper grammar, and whether you can develop the topic. That is what your rater is checking. They're not checking whether you, you're writing in all caps. So it's not a problem. Okay. Even in computer-based, right? Ms. Yes, yes, okay. it's not a problem. All right, so another question from Jason. I have additional question. Does it have an additional cost once we avail your preparation bundle promo? All right, um, the preparation bundle promo is free. Um, to our registered IELTS test takers. The premium services that we have, those are the ones with um, certain fees. So you just need to visit our site um, to check out all the paid preparation tools that we have for our test takers and the ones that are for free. So for example, if you have booked for a test and also paid for it, 
you need to check your payment confirmation because all the links for the preparation tools that we offer are actually indicated in that email. All right. So visit idp.com to see all the other preparation tools that we have because um, some of the preparation tools that we have are actually being also uh, are also being offered by IELTS Australia. Some of them are paid. So like the progress check, things like that. So you visit our page for the paid ones and check your payment confirmation for the free ones. Okay, so for another question from Sherry May Zornosa, even with, sorry, even with reading and listening, we can write all caps in computer-based? Yes, definitely, yes. With reading and listening, what your rater is checking, if you follow the instruction about the number of words, okay? Mm -hmm. And also whether you gave the right answer. That's being that what is being checked, not capitalization. No. It's all about following directions, let's say one word or a number. That's it. So you don't really have to worry whether you are writing in all caps. It's not a big problem in IELTS, no. If I just may add or um, I just want test takers to realize the timing is very, very important. So for the computer delivered IELTS during the listening test, they are not given the 10 minute transfer of answers because they'll be simply clicking on the screen and probably um, moving some words uh, or dragging some words on the screen. But for the paper based IELTS, test takers are given 10 minutes transfer time so yeah so i uh i think some test takers they want to transfer their answers already to the answer sheet and fail to really focus on the test itself so what we advise test takers is that they focus on the question booklet first focus on listening to the audio and answering all the questions then after that you'll be given 10 minutes that's actually sufficient for you to transfer your answers to um the answer sheet right now for the reading test, some mistakes of our test takers, this is for the paper-based IELTS, is that they forget to transfer their answers from the question booklet to the answer sheet. If you fail to do that, you are not given any extra minute to transfer, just to transfer your answer. Meaning, if you fail to transfer your answers to the answer sheet, you would get a zero. You won't be marked for it. We, um, the ones, the clerical markers, they don't mark the question booklet, they mark the answer sheet. So timing is very important. When do you need to transfer your um, answers? Are you being careful? Are you checking the spelling when you're transferring your answers? So yeah, you can um, write your answers in all capital letters, but just be very, very careful with the spelling. And if you are writing it on the correct number, okay? So just be very careful when it comes to transferring answers. Just That's just an added tip to our paper-based test takers. All right. Any more questions, guys? It's your chance. <laughs> it's your chance, guys. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, I think we'd be uh, doing it, I hope, another... Another uh, lecture. And, Seminar. Yeah. Yes. We've scheduled it so, already. Miss yeah. <laughs> Gladys, uh, yes. yeah, I'll, I, I want you, because I actually promised this last time that we had this yeah. webinar, we'll be giving away five free slots for the writing in hands. Remember a while ago, it's yeah. um, mm -hmm. 500 pesos. Um, you have the attendees, the ones who ask questions, you can choose five from them and you can send Ooh. their email addresses to me and we will... Yeah, um, we will send them email so that they can enjoy the free writing in hands. <laughs> wow. Uh, so, okay, so wow. you need to send me um, five attendees who ask questions tonight so that we can assist them and help them or at least get personalized feedback on their writing test. Okay, so that's your homework. 
ma'am. <laughs> yes, I'm writing now. <laughs> Who are these people? <laughs> All right. While I'm seeing them on the chat box, so that mm-hmm. I need five, right? Yes, ma'am. I know you have access to the chat. I, I can't see the questions that they're asking. But yes, yeah, you, we end um, on Monday. We'll get in touch with them so that we can give them the instructions and we can start um, giving them the prompts or the questions. Okay. okay. Uh, those from last week, you already uh, messaged them, right? Um, yeah, I actually would be needing your help on that because oh. I wasn't able to check the ones who asked questions as well. I wasn't able to save the chat. Okay, okay. okay. I'll just look for... So probably <laughs> or If you want, if you want, Ms. Rain, we can choose 10 here because before we were not be, we were not able to um, secure the chat box because we forgot to... <laughs> yeah. Although I, I okay. listed down some, some of the names. So, but then, yeah, I'll, I'll get in touch with you for last week's um, five attendees right okay okay of course <laughs> okay i need one okay 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 i think that's it <laughs> okay uh, i've seen i've already written five okay 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 so i think that's it for tonight if there's no more questions any more questions, guys? Before we, uh, before we um call it a night. So no more <laughs> questions, so that we can if, take a rest now. <laughs> okay. If so we um, have questions, mm-hmm. send us an email. I um the one that we showed you a while ago. You can send us an email. Okay. So thank you, Miss Lorraine and Miss Cass for. For your time tonight, and then we will be seeing you next week. Or am I correct? Is it next week? Every other week. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> or another week. <laughs> okay, I'll just post it and then I'll just send you the um registration invite. Okay. All right. So thank you everyone. So good night. Good night from the Philippines. Bye. Good night. Thank, Bye. You. thank you. Thank you.